Well, welcome all you wiretappers. I'm here in Kansas City in my studio, Gangland Wire. Uh, it, it's a very stormy day. We had a hell of a storm last night. I had to go out in the balcony and pick everything up this morning and blew plants over. It was crazy last night here in the middle of a Midwestern summer. But speaking of the Midwest, I have, as you can see on your screen, I have James Cosenza of the Chicago Mob Trials YouTube page. So I'm saying that slow so you can write that down. James Cosenza, C-O-S-Z-E-N-A, right? Cosenza, yes. Cosenza, and it's the Chicago Mob Trials YouTube page. Welcome, Jim. I really am happy to have you back on here. Pleasure to be here, Gary. Good to see you. Tell the guys a little bit about your YouTube page, what they're, what they're going to see on it. Okay, my, uh, my YouTube channel is... Uh, Chicago Mob Trials by Jay Cosenza. And basically, it's an insight, a perspective from a court buff's view. Back in the 90s to the early 2000s, I attended 25 plus major federal trials downtown Chicago. So my little YouTube stories are basically um, an insight from what it was like being um, an observer at some of these large trials. So basically, I'm just talking about uh, all the major federal trials that I went to. And one thing I wanted to point out is all these trials are open to the public. Any one of us can go at any time. And I highly recommend if there is a trial in your area, in your city, by all means, go check it out. It's it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I wish I'd have done a bunch of bars back in the day, but I don't know. I just, you know, you just forget about it. You don't think about it. And all of a sudden it's going and it's here and it's gone. I could have attended all those skim trials. That would have been cool. But oh, God, you know, yeah. Hindsight's twenty twenty, as they say. So James has been on here before and we've talked about the Family Secrets trial and some of the good ship lollipop trial, the Bobby Salerno and some other trials. And and he goes even to even more detail on his YouTube channel. So check that out, guys. And like and subscribe his channel too. We, you know, one one uh, uh one boat and a rising tide needs to help the other boat rise at the same time. And and so we all help each other and and bringing this mob history to you guys. So we, we are, and that's one thing I like about James is just straight history. You know, there's no spin on it. There, there's no, you know, uh, blaming this guy or blaming that guy. There's just as, this is what happened at the trial, just like you, you had been at the trial. So we're going to talk about a kind of a side story from the Samlet family secrets trial, which was really almost ended the Chicago outfit. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. Yep. They took down the Chinatown crew and this uh, Frank Calabrese. They called it the family secrets trial, which I think you maybe mentioned or pointed this out to me because the two main witnesses were uh, uh, Nick Calabrese, Frank Calabrese Jr. against their brother and dad, uh, Frank Calabrese Sr. So family secrets came rolling out, didn't they? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, and now Frank Calabrese Jr.'s wife lisa swan has a book out there too uh i i did an interview with her check that out and you can get the book i think i called it diary of a mob wife but it, it's in there lisa swan s-w-a-n so we're going to do a didn't side cam help her with that didn't cam help her with that yeah cam uh my, my guy that's uh done a bunch of shows with me camulus robinson and done some other bunch of chicago stuff he he co-wrote that with her he's the writer i mean she she's a good gal and i remember interviewing her she's really nice but she's not the writer, but Cam is a writer. He can write. So he's uh he he wrote, co-wrote that with her. Look forward to that. So let's talk about this side story to the family secrets trial, which was the extortion of a guy named Victor Cacciatore. Tell us how that went down. Okay. Well, at the legendary family secrets trial, there was close to 200 witnesses in one witness that took the stand, I'll never forget. He was not only a witness, but he was also a victim of an extortion plot. This gentleman's name was Victor Cacciatore. He's probably in his late 70s, early 80s. He was very well-dressed, an older gentleman. He had a nice tan. And you could just tell by his aura, he was a, a wealthy man, just by the way he carried himself. So Victor, Victor Cacciatore got on the stand and he basically told the story how he was how he was part of an extortion scam 
by the Chinatown crew or the 26th Street crew. Victor Katch's story, he told the story how he came to this country like a lot of immigrants. He couldn't even speak English. He had maybe 50 cents to his name. But Victor Cacciatore, he went to school, he studied, and he worked. He eventually uh, bought his first building in Chicago, and then from there became a very successful realtor in Chicago. If you're on 290 Expressway going into the Chicago Loop, right before you get to State Street, you'll see his building. And at night, it's lit up in bright neon letters, Cacciatore Real Estate. Most people in Chicago, we've heard of Victor Cacciatore because we've, you know, seen his buildings and his uh, his signs all over. So Victor Cacciatore, he eventually became very successful in the real estate business here in Chicago. And at the time, he lived in Bridgeport. Bridgeport is an old Italian patch, a uh, very prominent neighborhood uh, near White Sox Park, just south of downtown Chicago. A lot of the Chicago outfit guys grew up there. Uh, also, uh, Mayor Daly and his son are born and raised in Bridgeport, as well as many Chicago policemen, judges, politicians. So it's a very popular, very powerful neighborhood. <laughs> I bet I bet they didn't have any problem get the snow removed at the winter time in that neighborhood. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a lot of perks and uh, favors living in that neighborhood. Now, exactly. <laughs> Victor Cacciatore was just one man that lived in that neighborhood. Also, boss of the Chinatown crew or the 26th Street crew, Angela Lapetria lived in, lived in that neighborhood as well. Now, I'm going to talk about Victor Cacciatore's testimony as well as Nick Calabrese's testimony. Nick Calabrese testified that Angela Lapetria, his boss, boss of the 26th Street crew, he hated, he despised Victor Cacciatore. When Mitch Mars asked Nick why, he said he didn't know his guess. Angela Lapetria is probably jealous of Victor Cacciatore. Victor Cacciatore testified he was in his office working. Two men came to see him. They showed up unannounced. Victor Cacciatore testified that he thought they were salesmen. So he told his secretary to, to send him away. She sent him away. A couple weeks later, the same two guys, Nick Calabrese and his partner in crime, Ronnie Jarrett, an associate of the 26th Street crew, they went back to Victor Cacciatore's office. This time, they actually were able to sit down with him. And they basically sat him down and demanded, a, I don't remember the dollar amount, but it was like two, dollars $300,000. They wanted a large amount of money from him, or to put it bluntly, he was going to have some problems. Now, Victor Cacciatore was an honest businessman. He had nothing to do with the Chicago outfit. He made his fortune legally in real estate. So Victor Cacciatore, after these guys left, he he testified he didn't really do anything. He he didn't really know what to do. So fast forward a few weeks, Nick Calabrese, one of the main witnesses at the Family Secrets trial, he testified to participating in 14 murders. He testified that one day he took some dead rats, some dead mice, and made these little nooses. And he tied the rope nooses around the dead rats and dead mice and hung them from Victor Cacciatore's car antenna. Mm -hmm. Victor Cacciatore testified that he was leaving, leaving office one day and he saw these dead mice and dead rats with these little nooses on his car. He he didn't know what to think of it. He uh, He thought maybe it was some some kids, some punks playing a, playing a sick joke. Victor Cacciatore also spoke in very broken English. You could tell he was definitely from the old country. So fast forward a couple weeks later, Nick Calabrese testified. He cut off a small puppy's head. Ooh. He beheaded a small dog and put that head on Victor Cacciatore's hood of his car. 
Victor, Tex- Victor Cacciatore was going to work one day and he saw a dead puppy's head. He testified he was he was startled, he was disgusted, and again, he, he had no idea, what, what is this? Why are they doing this? Nick Calabrese testified that one day Victor Cacciatore went to start his car and Nick showed on the witness stand how he held the shotgun. He held it on an angle because he didn't want to kill Victor Cacciatore, but he wanted to scare him. So as soon as Victor Cacciatore started the car, Nick Calabrese blew out his back window. This scared the bejesus out of Victor Cacciatore. He thought maybe his car blew up. He didn't know what to think. Well, now, after the dead mice, after the puppy's head, and now blowing out the shotgun window, now they got Victor Cacciatore's attention. He was scared. He was nervous. He didn't know what to do. So he testified that the only man who could help him was boss of the 26th Street crew, Angelo Lepetria. So Victor Cacciatore went to Angelo Lepetria's social club and explained to him exactly what happened, that two men came there, demanded a couple hundred thousand dollars. They threatened him. He told uh, Angela Lepetria about the dead mice, the dead rats, where they were hung on his antenna by nooses. He testified about finding a, a puppy's head on the roof of his car. And he told Angela Petri about um, somebody blowing out his shotgun, blowing out his back window. Angela Petri didn't say one word. He just listened. When Victor Cacciatore was finished, Angela Petria said, I'll get back to you. Give me a few weeks, I'll get back to you. Nick Calabrese testified that Angela Petria deliberately made him wait almost a month. So this whole time, poor Victor Cacciatore didn't know what was happening next. He didn't know if these guys were coming back, but he was mostly concerned about his family. He thought his family could get hurt. Finally, about a month later, after making Victor Cacciatore wait, Angela Petria called him back to the club. He sat him down and he told him, you got a serious problem. These are very dangerous men. If you don't pay them the money, they will hurt you and most likely your family. So Victor Cacciatore kind of pleaded and begged Angelo for help. Angela Petria held up two fingers, and what that meant was, you have to pay me $2 million for this problem to go away. Hmm. So Victor Victor Cacciatore somewhat was glad to pay Angelo for protection, for his problems to go away, for nobody to, to, to harass him. What Victor Cacciatore did not know at that time, and he found out years later, Angela Petria was the one behind the extortion the entire time. He's the one that sent Nick Calabrese in there to blow out the back window, scare him with the puppy's head and the nooses. After that, Mitch Mars, the late Mitch Mars, the main prosecutor in the Family Secrets trial, he asked Nick Calabrese, how much did you get for tying nooses around the dead rats, the dead mice, and putting them on the antenna of the car? How much did you get for cutting off that little puppy's head? How much did Angela Petria pay you for blowing out, shooting out his back window? Nick Calabrese says in a very low monotone voice, he said, I got nothing. I got paid nothing. Hmm. And the whole courtroom was kind of shocked by this. Like, you didn't get paid anything? Mitch Marr says, yeah, I didn't get paid nothing. I was given an order and I follow orders just like the Army. So that's my short story for today, Gary, how Victor Cacciatore was extorted $2 million by Angela LaPetri and the 26th Street crew. Wow. I tell you what, that's uh, that's old school. I mean, that harkens back to the old black hand days when uh, Sicilian shopkeeper would get a successful business going or a restaurant, a spaghetti joint, as they used to call them. And, and the black handers would come in and, and threaten to kidnap their kids or 
you know, any kind of all kinds of things that, that they would do to him. I, I know we had a, a lady killed in about 1915, I think, who had a real successful store and was killed by a shotgun and by the black hand because she wouldn't pay the extortion. I mean, that's that's old school. That Angel La Pietra is uh, has that old school mean evil dude there. I, I, I remember <laughs> Frank Calabrese testified nobody, none of the outfit guys or associates. None of them like being anywhere near Angela Lepetria. <laughs> and Frank Calabrese testified he was the only one that that had the balls to look Angela in the eyes. But all the other outfit guys didn't like being around this man. <laughs> I guess he was pretty nasty. He must have been. And, and it kind of now it makes sense that uh, Jerry Scalise and that Art Rachel and some third dude, I can't remember his name, were trying to rob la pietra's widow they were they were in the process of breaking in her house and the fbi had them wired or bugged in some manner and they were waiting for them to show up and as soon as they started to go in the house they took them off but i always wondered you know how you know that how, how can you violate a guy who had been a, a crew of you know the leader of the chinatown crew or the 26th street crew how could you rob his widow but i think i see now why he was open game he was fair game after he died on your next trip to Chicago, that's one place I definitely want to take you to. It's right there in Bridgeport, right across from White Sox Park. You could see Angelo Lapetria's compound. Uh -huh. And right across the street is the uh, Italian American Social Club. So we could hit oh, yeah. two birds with one stone. Yeah, that, that would be a good one. Yeah, I look forward to that. I'll get up there as soon as I can. Uh, let it cool down a little bit. It's been hotter than hell down here. I don't know about up there, but uh, kind of like to ride the motorcycle back up. But riding a motorcycle in downtown Chicago or on the streets is it's hard. It's like work. <laughs> so much traffic and they go so fast. It was just uh, it, it scared the heck out of me. You know, we had a, a similar extortion. I mean, these mob guys, whatever city they're in, they do this. They find a successful businessman that's really done it on his own. It's not part of the establishment. It's not part of the white collar uh, circuit, the silk stocking circuit that, that, you know, or his family had money. They find these guys that came up the hard way and, and have done well. And then they go after him. We had a guy that was, uh, he was kind of a scammer and, and they really like guys that have been bordering on the edge too. Now catch a Tory wasn't, but we had a guy that was kind of a used car salesman that did really well, bought a strip club. And then, one of our mob bosses, uh, Cork Savella, sent a couple of his henchmen over to put a stick of dynamite under his car and just, you know, let it go off while the guy was inside his club. And then he came back around and he said, well, you know, you've got some trouble with some young guys. I can take care of them for you. I can make sure they don't bother you anymore. But, you know, you're going to have to take me in as kind of a silent partner on this strip club, and which he did, you know. I mean, he didn't have any choice. Now, he got lucky. Court got a lot of trouble after that because of the skim and from Las Vegas and caught cases and, and ended up in the penitentiary. So he was able to move out from under him pretty quick. But that's, you know, typical. We had another guy named Johnny Francovilla. He would send a guy, he had a guy he would send out to some businessman he knew his porch and at the middle of the night and just throw a stick of dynamite on it. And then he'd come back around a day or two later and say, Hey, I hear you had trouble, had a stick of dynamite, went off in your house. Let me check this out for you. And then he'd take like five thousand dollars and he'd handle the problem for him. So that's that's a pretty common thing. And the victim thinks he's actually getting help. Yeah, exactly. They don't know, they don't understand. It reminds me of a very similar story. Just what you said at the family secrets trial, there's a fame, a, a well-known pizza, pizza place in Chicago called, uh, I think it's called Connie's pizza. They've got them all over. And the owner was good friends with Frank Calabrese senior. Right. Mm -hmm. So Frank Calabrese senior sent a couple of his guys to put the squeeze on the owner of Connie's pizza. Mm hmm. Yeah. And the owner of Connie's Pizza went to his good friend, Frank Calabrese, for <laughs> there you help. Go. Yep, there you go. <laughs> he had no idea until years later that Frank Calabrese was actually behind the extortion. Yeah, yeah. It's a, that's a cold world. That is that is a brutal, cold world in which nobody can trust anybody. You just You better steer clear away from them. I wonder how far they would have carried that with uh, Victor Cacciatore. If, if La Pietra hated him so much, he was so jealous, I'm sure – 
Nick Calabrese had that peg right. He was just jealous of him. There's a, here's a guy that came from the old country and made it really made it legitimately. Boy, I, uh, I, I wonder how far he would have gone with that. If, if he would, have cause you, you don't want to kill the golden goose, the, the lays a <laughs> golden egg. They might get out of hand. Somebody might make a mistake with that shotgun next time. <laughs> you know, oh God, yeah. Don't need that in your life. That's for sure. That's that's why somebody's asked me, well, you ought to like go into business with one of these mob guys in your podcast, you know, go in partnership. I said, I'm not doing a partnership with a mob guy because, you know, and there's a lot of good guys out there. They have their own business and they have it going. I don't need that kind of aggravation because they don't play by my rules. I yeah. play by the rules of the courts of the land. You know, Sir. you do not play by my rules. They weren't raised like that. They've never they, you know, I'm not saying that they would extort you today or cheat you today, but I don't need that. <laughs> I don't need that at all. We, too bad that Nick Calabrese had would uh, gone into partnership with you before he died up there in, in Chicago. You know, just you just remember, did you know uh, Judge Zago passed away? Oh, really? Yeah, he was um, he was appointed by Ronald Reagan back in the 80s. Yeah. Presided over a thousand trials, but he. He presided at the Family Secrets trial yeah. as well as uh, the Blagojevich trial. But the reason I bring him up, a lot of the main players at the Family Secrets trial, Joey Lombardo, Frank Calabrese, Mitch Mars, a lot of these guys have all passed away. Yeah, yeah, they're they're just about the Family Secrets deal, except for a few witnesses that were out there. Uh, they're just, they're about gone. Yeah. And, and We I were all about- hoping... We were all hoping there was going to be a Family Secrets 2, yeah. a part two, but it, it never happened. Yeah. So I, I don't even know about any of the agents. I've never actually seen an agent that was really intimately involved with that being interviewed. And I, I asked around about them, and I'm, I'm not getting any names that I can find to interview. That would be an excellent interview if you could interview one or two of um the agents or maybe even a, a guy like uh Marcus Funk or um uh John Scully these were part of the prosecution team they could really go into greater detail yeah. than me or anybody else but yeah. yeah if you could get an agent or a prosecutor um I could I could send you a couple names but I wouldn't know how to re- how to contact okay. them but All right. yeah, that would be a great yeah. guess for you yeah, send me, especially the agents. I, I've heard of that Marcus Funk, and I realized he was one of the assistant prosecutors. I need to make myself a note on that one. And then there's a guy, John Scully. I mean, there's a whole team. John Scully, Gary Shapiro. Now, um, your good friend, um, Paul Whitcomb. How do you say his name? Whitcomb, Paul, Paul Whitcomb. Yeah. Well, Paul, I didn't know Paul at the time, but he went to the – uh he went Gus to Alex yeah. trial. He went to the family secrets trial, but I, I just didn't know the man, but him and I talked a little bit, but he knows a lot of these uh, prosecutors and uh, agents. Okay. He may be one to, to lean on yeah. for that. Yeah. It might, might be a guy that would be a good contact. But uh, the guys I'm talking about, they haven't done any YouTube interviews yet. <laughs> no, so, they haven't. I know. I know. I haven't you know. seen any interviews anywhere. <laughs> Another good one for you, Gary, who who's very uh he's super busy, but he's very um very uh friendly and sociable is Joe Lopez, Joe the Shark. Oh yeah, you know, I interviewed him one time. He's so oh, busy. He did. Yeah, a long time ago. It was about a couple of mob associates that had a yeah, of course he does cocaine, he does narcotics work primarily. Uh Joe has the the shark. And I did get him interviewed at, at the start of COVID. He wasn't doing very much, and so I was able to get him to squeeze in. I think it's that's it's been three years since I've talked to him. Yeah, he was a good guy. He's a good storyteller and everything. So yeah, he would be a great guest because um, he, you know, I always tease him like, how 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 did you control Frank Calabrese in the courtroom? How can you? <laughs> really? He told me that um, during the Sam Carlisi trial, Anthony the Hatch Chiramonte. That uh-huh. he was worse than Frank Calabrese as totally. far as trying to control him. So Joe has all kinds of good stories. Yeah, he would. He would. He would. I. I. I don't know. I, maybe I have to make another run on him. Like I said, even then, he was so busy. He finally, I just had to keep pushing and pushing and pushing to get him to squeeze some time in, and finally he did. But, uh, but he was a good one. 
Another uh, guy that passed away from the Family Secrets trial. This is old news. This guy was a Vietnam veteran. He played uh, for the NHL. Uh, Rick Halpern, he was Joey Lombardo's lawyer. Oh, yeah, Rick Halpern, yeah. And after that, after the trial, I'll never forget, Joey was pounding his king on the – Pounding his cane on the floor, yelling at Rick Halpern. A lot of these guys, they blame the lawyers. <laughs> yeah. But unfortunately, Rick Halpern, um, he had some, um, I think, some severe back pain, back issues, and unfortunately, he, he, uh, he killed himself. He, he, oh, really? I didn't realize that. Yeah, we did. But I did. There's a lot of a lot of the main players at the Family Secret trial. A lot of them have have passed away. That's it. They're about going. All right. James Casenza, I really appreciate you coming on and telling us that little story. Well, guys, you know I like to ride motorcycles, so don't forget to look out for motorcycles when you're out there, especially if you're in Chicago and I go to Chicago. I was about run down several times up there. It's crazy. If you have a problem with PTSD and you've been in the service, go to the VA website and get that hotline. And if you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, you need to see our friend Anthony Ruggiano, a real deal Gambino member who is a treatment center counselor, I believe, down in Florida. He's got the hotline to get hold of him or his facility uh, on his website, anthonyruggiano.com. So thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe if you think of it and share this with your friends or on your social media. And come back and listen to some more good mob stories. Thanks a lot. We'll be Thanks, in touch. Gary. All right. Bye. Good seeing you, man. Thank you. All right.